Nick and Molly just moved to the city and can't agree on what they want. They are young and energetic and looking for a new church home. We'll take some personality tests, tour the sites, ask some questions, and based on taste, experience, and location, we'll find them the perfect congregation. I'm Corey Clark, and welcome to Church Hunters. We're so excited to find a church. We just started dating. Um, with the churches we go to now, just not, like for us, just not really doing it for us, you know? Right, I, I go to a satellite campus. I just find it hard to connect emotionally with a video screen. It's just... Okay, you cry during cake walks. So like, we've been doing a lot of services online, a lot of podcasts. There are a lot of preachers we do like. Really good, but we want we want serious yet funny. Yeah, like commanding of the stage yet relatable, you mm -hmm. know? We're more looking for uh, the humor of Andy Stanley with the body of Stephen Furtick. Hey guys, What's I'm Corey. Good to see you, my name's Nick, this hey, is Molly. Hey guys, welcome to Church Hunters. This is your first church, this is Creekside First Baptist. So while it is traditional, it's still pretty current. Just this year, the pastor started untucking his shirts. Oh, Ooh, wow. that's good. Big deal. He does dress his age though, so don't worry. He's past the Osteen suit phase, but he hasn't gone full giggly yet. Because huh. there's holes in the knees or no? Well, it's frayed, but no holes. Frayed, oh. no, okay, got it, yeah. perfect. Okay. So hey, let me show you around, okay? Right, Come on. Good. I do love this lobby. It's a great lobby, you know? Yeah. It's not too big, not too small. Yeah. It should be enough room to catch up, chat with your friends. But here's a great thing, there's a bunch of side exits, so if you need to leave early and catch the game, you can do that. Got it. Yeah. yeah. Honestly, right up front, uh, didn't love the name. No, I, First Baptist? Who names a church that anymore? I just... Not these days, we're looking no. for like a Thrive Church, maybe Relevant Church, I don't know, Radiant Church, something. This is the soundboard they use here. Now remember, it's pretty traditional here. So, when Sunday comes around, they turn it way down low. Oh, God. <laughs> But the one knock on this church, they still use the child care numbering system on the screens. Ooh, uh, yeah. Way. Or as the moms like to call it, the sanctuary walk of shit. Yeah. <laughs> the Sunday morning experience was just a little too traditional for, for us. For us. I mean, the pastor's main point, 157 characters. I can't tweet that. I really think you guys are going to love this place. I like we it. We do. We like Feels it. Yeah. You know, it's diverse, but it's not like too diverse, you know? Scripture heavy sermons? Oh, yeah. Yeah? yeah. What about uh, as a community oriented? Absolutely. Great. Oh, women in ministry? The parking situation, you guys gotta see it. Super rare nowadays. Okay. It was like a, a maybe for when my parents come into to town yeah. for a church for Christmas. Easter type of church. Like a holiday, holiday type church. One of the main reasons that I love this church for you guys is that on your personality test, Molly, you scored high in service and hospitality. Oh, babe. And there's a great welcome team you could join. Perfect. Okay. And then Nick, you scored really high in need for accountability. Wow. And the men's groups here are amazing. You just, you just gonna put that out there? Hey, God like knows that. your heart, okay? On the next episode of Church Hunters. I think you're really going to love this place. They take relevance to a whole new level. This church identifies as inter-denon-denominational. This pastor speaks out of a brand new translation. It's the Tumblr Bible. All right, good morning, everybody. How are y'all doing today? Cool, glad y'all can make it. Ah. So believe it or not, that video was at least sort of related in my mind to what we're going to talk about. So maybe it will, maybe it will pan out, or maybe you'll think uh, that didn't have anything to do with what you were saying. So um, just want to pray to get started. Father, I just thank you for this chance for us to come together and to worship you. And uh, I just pray right now, Lord, that you would anoint every person to hear your word, Lord, I pray you would use the, the words of my mouth to speak with your message. And Lord, we take authority over the kingdom of darkness that seeks to prevent your kingdom from going forward. Lord, we love you and we lift you up and we just give you this time. In Christ's name I pray, amen. So before I get started, um, I know Sam mentioned it in the announcements, but I want to talk just a moment about the Bible study Sunday mornings. Um, we have just started the book of Leviticus, and I know everybody who's ever tried to read through the Bible, very few people make it through the book of Leviticus. But I think it's really cool um, because you can see God and Jesus in it and what he has done for us. So if you've ever, like, I don't understand what's going on in the Bible, 
Um, it just doesn't make sense. It's like Greek or Hebrew or some other language. We'll show up at 9 o'clock with your questions. We just did Leviticus chapter 1 today. We're doing chapter 2 tomorrow. And like I say, show up and ask questions, and it makes for a much better class. I thought today was awesome. Uh, my class doubled from last week. There were four people. <laughs> so, um, but we had a lot of fun just um, asking questions and sharing the different insights God had given us. So, um, but I want to talk to you today about another F word. And it's actually the title of my sermon is another F word. Uh, when Brian asked me to preach uh, a few weeks ago, I asked him what he was talking about. And he was like, um, frustrations. And what was the other F word, Brian? Forgiveness. And I was like, ooh, well, I can do faithfulness and we can do, you know, uh, the F word series or, you know, come up with some, some good catchy name, but probably not. So anyway, I decided that I would title mine the F word. And we're going to talk, like I can say, about faithfulness. And one of the things before we get started, or as I'm getting started, I just want to mention there's a difference between conviction and condemnation. Whenever you're doing something wrong, and you're missing the mark that God has set for you, I mean, that's called sin. And we all know that. And some people want to gloss over and say, you know, if they do it, it's sin. If I do it, it's just because I struggle. And we've talked about that in previous sermons. But, you know, when you're doing something wrong and God wants to bring change in your life, he shows you that you're doing wrong, but then he convicts you. And then his grace is there to change you and to make you a new person again. Whereas when the enemy comes in, the enemy wants to condemn you and tell you you're just a pathetic person, you've messed up again, you're the only one struggling with that, don't talk to anyone because they're going to kick you out of the church. If they knew what you did, no one would talk to you. Well, you know, since nobody talks to me anyway, that's not a big deal. But for other people, I could see where that would be an issue. So anyway, if... if if God convicts you, that's not the same thing as condemnation. And don't let the enemy lie to you and say, it's over, I blew it, I'm out of here. You know, that, that's not it. Jesus is here, he forgives, he transforms, and he makes us after him. He makes us more like him every day. The Bible talks about going from glory to glory. And as we're transformed, they become more like him. So I want to just... Keep that in mind. Um, sometimes what I say can sting a little, and it's not meant to sting, it's meant to heal. So, and also, just, I know I say it all the time, but I'm not, I'm not telling y'all to get up here about all the stuff I've conquered. These are issues in my life, and I see them, and when I ask God what to share, it's like, well, you know, talk about what you're doing wrong, so uh, they don't think you're perfect, and you don't think you're perfect, and we can all learn together. So, a couple of questions I want you to think about. Don't raise your hand. You don't have to answer. Don't say yes, but. So, do you consistently read your Bible? Do you consistently pray? Do you consistently have some type of fellowship with other believers? You know, you can sum up those questions and say, are you trying to live out the faith that you claim to believe? And now here is the thing. You can say, yes, I read my Bible, yes, I pray, yes, I fellowship with other believers, hey, I'm living out my faith. You can do all of that, and you can miss it. Because you can go, yeah, I read the Bible. As a matter of fact, I teach Bible. I don't see many other people teaching Bible, so that's one mark for me. Pray, I lead prayer meeting. Another mark for me. Look at me, super spiritual. No, no, no. Don't do that, because when you get caught up in that, it becomes about you and not about God. So to kind of illustrate this point, I've got some scripture I want to get to. But first, I want to quote from one of the premier philosophers of our generation. It's the great Toby Keith. So he says, you know, thinking about you makes me grin. But every now and then, I want to think about me. I want to think about I, number one, oh my, me, my, what I think, what I like, what I know, what I want, what I see. Yeah, I like talking about you, 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 you usually, but occasionally, I want to talk about me. Now, I know that's a little old song, and you know, that's funny lyrics, and that might be new to y'all because that's country music, and I used to listen to country a lot, I still do some, and I know, but 
the thing is, we can get so caught up in me that we can read the Bible and it can be all about me. It doesn't become about God, it becomes about me. And so uh, we're going to be in Psalm 139. So, uh, and we're going to go through the first part and uh, we're going to put the ESV version, English Standard Version, up on the screen for you to follow, about, follow through. Um, and like I say, this is Psalm 139 if you want to go and read it later. So I'm going to read it, but listen to the way I read it. Oh Lord, you have searched me and you know me. You know when I sit down. You know when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down, and you are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You hem me in, behind and before you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's high and I cannot attain it. And so you can read the Bible and you can think it's all about you. And yes, God reveals you in scripture. But then, you know, you get that me-centered mindset and you find some verse like Jeremiah 29, 11, the number one coffee cup verse in all the lands. You know, um, for I know the promises I have for you, declares the Lord, plan to prosper you, going to give you hope and a future. You know, I'm blessed going in. I'm blessed going out. I'm the head. I'm not the tail. A thousand may fall on my side, 10,000 on my right hand, but it won't come near me. And all of a sudden, the Bible becomes this great book of how I'm so awesome, and God loves me, and I'm super special, very special. And God proved it, because the Bible's all about me. So, and we get there, and we lose the point, because we started with this me-centered thought, and we go to the Bible, and it confirms the me-centeredness. And then I try to take this me-centered thing and work up to God. And what I get is this religion that it says a lot of the right words. And if somebody's looking, parts of it may even look right on the outside. But it's not about God. It's about me. And it's about how to make me feel good. And about how to make sure I'm number one and I'm most important. And that works fine when you're by yourself. But what happens when you hook up with somebody else and they think they're number one and they think they're most important and the Bible's all about them? Well, then you clash. And the next thing you know, you have the first Baptist church and the second Baptist church. And then you have the third Baptist church. And then you have the redeemed glorious Baptist church. And then somebody actually just says, forget it, and the we're better than you Baptist church. And they're all sitting right next to each other because the Bible, we started with us. And we tried to work our way up to God, and we find that doesn't work very well because we're not a good foundation. But if we start with the foundation of God and work our way down to us, then I think that creates a more stable platform that God can teach us and reveal things to us. So I'm going to go back to uh, Psalm 139. I'm going to read the same scriptures, but I'm going to read them just a little differently this time. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is formed in my tongue, O oh Lord, you know it all together. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. I cannot attain it. I read the same words. I didn't add a word. I didn't take away a word. What was different? The difference was the focus was on God. And the focus was on you, O oh Lord. You're the one who has made me. It's not on God made me. And I'm number one. Because I get to stand up here today in front of everybody. And you know, that, it doesn't work. That it's pride. It's using this it's using the scripture to make me important, to make me feel good. I don't want to die to myself, like the Bible says, and live for Christ. I demand that Christ bow down and worship me. Because, hey, you know, the Bible does say I'm blessed going in. Well, I mean, really? 
I mean, what is being blessed going in me? What is blessed coming out me? Jeremiah 29, 11 plays real good Sunday morning in America. But, you know, what about Iran and Iraq, where Christians are actually dying for their faith? You know, Jeremiah 29, 11 might mean something a little bit different over there. God knows the plans he has for us. And they are plans to prosper us. And they do give us hope. And they do provide a future for us. But the end isn't. So I can be fat and lazy sitting in front of my 60-inch TV. Can't decide because I only have 200 channels to watch and nothing looks good. So then I have to go out and get Netflix and then Amazon Prime and then Hulu. And then, you know, let me get Apple Play. And let me get Google Play. And there's still nothing on it. So then I go to Redbox and get a movie that I forget about for two months. And they end up charging me $25. All just so I feel satisfied. And I feel special. And I feel worthy. No, the problem is we're lazy. We don't look to God. We look to ourselves. And we say, God, how can I take... We don't even say God. We just say Seth. Or we say Google these days. How can I take this word and make myself feel good? And, you know, I can write a book, I can start a blog, a podcast, people can listen. And, you know, if you listen to what's called the Word of Faith Preachers, you know, give God a dollar, he'll give you a hundred later. Um, if you get sick, you know, it's because you're not praying right or whatever. And the thing is, they use scripture, and scripture's true. But so many people miss what's being taught and what the scripture teaches. And it's about making me feel good in my life down here on earth. And it gets to the point to where it just infects us more and more because the more we worship ourselves, the more we put pride on the throne of our life, then the stronger it gets and the more we look to it and the more we see through it. And then it gets to the point to where we come to church and we sit in a song service and it's not worship. It's a concert. And we like, I didn't get anything out of worship today. Now this is just an aside. I think if you didn't get anything out of worship today, something's wrong with you. Because worship was awesome. The band did a great job. I almost like, okay, I don't need to preach today. Because they, you know. But we get to this point. Worship, I didn't get anything out of worship. I didn't like those songs. The music's too loud. Why can't they use some color other than blue and the lights? Does it have to be a motion background? Every song, my gosh, can't you just put the words up there and you just complain and you find fault and you sit back there. Maybe you even stand. Everybody's raising their hands, so I'm going to kind of raise mine so I don't look weird. But uh, the worship was awful. You know, really? I mean, really, is that the point of worship? I always have to ask Celia this, and I can never remember. But, you know, Silly and Todd, they, I don't remember which one of them said it, but worship is centering your whole being around the one thing that you believe gives life. Now, nobody is going to say that I believe I give life to myself because we know, but we act like that. And so when we come to worship and the focus isn't on us, then we think, I didn't get anything out of it. Well, one, who cares? If you didn't get anything out of worship, because the last time I checked, you weren't supposed to get anything out of worship. I'm not supposed to get anything out of worship. I'm supposed to bring my worship to God. What if God is up in heaven, and what if God is the one who's saying, I didn't get anything out of worship? Oh, I mean, ooh, I got the ghost box. You know, I kind of get the Jehovah Jiggle going. But I just, I didn't get anything. So what? You know the reason you don't get anything is because what time is it? Oh, I wonder how many steps I'm going to get today. Where am I going to go eat? What time do the Cowboys play? Oh, they play tonight. Oh, did you see that game yesterday in college? Oh, that one play, they lost 87 yards. Ha, 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 ha. You know, that's awesome. But I didn't get anything out of worship. You know, the thing is, we come in the doors of church or we, we turn on YouTube, or we put in a CD, or we hit shuffle um, on our play, or Spotify channel, or whatever, however. And we bring, you know, and we, we, we bring our stuff to worship. 
And we don't worship because we're thinking about how, you know, I am so alone and I'm sick and tired of being alone and I just want to spend some time with somebody. Or, you know, ah, do I want to wait till five o'clock before I get a drink or just go with this five o'clock somewhere and I'll sing to God with a beer in a hand, you know, and maybe a shot in the other one, you know, or, you know, ah, I could worship or I could look at some porn. Which one do I want to do? I'll do both or whatever, you know, and so we come and we bring this stuff and then we wonder why we don't get anything out of worship. Well, the reason we don't get anything out of worship is because we're too busy worshiping ourselves. The thing with worship is you don't just say, okay, okay, I know, I got all this stuff, but I'm going to pretend like I don't have it. Oh, life is perfect. Woohoo! Praise God! Woo! How, does that work? Does anybody think that actually works to pretend like my life isn't a wreck? To pretend like there's not a 200-pound gorilla sitting on my back saying, ha ha, take a step now. You know, that's not what worship is. What worship is, is saying, God, I have this stuff, and it's in my life, and it sucks, and I hate it. But you, God, are greater than this addiction you are greater than this pain. You are greater than this loneliness. This thing that I have that I don't talk about because then people would think I'm really weird and you can insert whatever your personal sin is that you don't hide. You know, you hide it because, you know, you don't want to get kicked out of church. You don't want to lose your position. Whatever. Just think about that when I'm saying this. We all have one. We pretend like we don't. I understand this is church. When somebody asks you how are you doing, you say fine. I understand. I say fine, too. You know, but we have this thing. Or, you might be like me, you might have a bunch of things that are just hanging on you, and they are ruining your life. And all you can see is these things, and they're getting in your face. Ah, you're worthless. You're never going to get a job. Nobody's ever going to reply to your resume again. You know, you're going to be alone. You're fat. You're ugly. You're a loser. You know, you failed. Ah, you're divorced. Ha ha. What's the Bible say about divorce? Ha ha. You know, really? I mean, that, that, those are the thoughts that run through our head. Pick one. If I didn't say yours, you know what it is better than I do. Don't pretend like it's not there. Just say, God, your word says that you're greater than this. And if I can't, in the midst of this corporate setting, see God is bigger than that, then I mean, what hope do I have out there? But what if... What if for just one time, just one time, we come together and we make a choice? Shut up, demon. For the next five minutes, I don't care. I might not have the strength to stand, but I can get on my knees and on my hands and I can at least look up or I can at least say God. And I can at least say that God, you are greater than this stuff that is hanging on me. It's, hang, it's here, God, it's here. I ain't hiding it from you, you know it anyway. I'm not going to pretend. It's here and it's bothering me and I hate it and my life sucks, but you are greater and you are changing me and you are transforming me. And I know there's coming a day when this will fall off. The weight of sin will be released. And until that point, God, you cover me. Your grace is sufficient for me. I am so glad that Paul said I have a thorn in my flesh and he didn't say exactly what it was. And, you know, there's so many commentaries and books about how it was glaucoma or it was because he was short or it was because he stuttered. Now, he had a thorn in his flesh and God told him that's the words he used because I have thorns in my flesh and I know exactly what he's going through in that situation. You can say, God help me, and sometimes, boom, it's gone. God help me, I've fallen again. Well, get up. It's okay. Jesus knew we would fall. He knew we would sin. He knew. His grace is still sufficient. His blood is still powerful. His grace is more than enough for us. And if we can come together in this place and choose to focus on God instead of on the crap, then in this place, we can get a breakthrough. And for five minutes, we can know what it's like to have a God who is greater than our problems. And if we can do it in here for five minutes, 
then later on today or tonight or this week, when we want to go back to that, there's this thought that says, but wait a minute, God is greater. And if God was greater at 1145 on Sunday morning, he's still greater at 11 p.m. Sunday night. He's still greater on Wednesday when you didn't go to church because you wanted to be alone. He's still greater on Saturday when you're like, you know, do I flush this Coke I bought down the toilet or do I use it? He's still greater. And if we can see God as greater here, then we can see God as greater there. And what happens here can change our life. Or, we can say, I didn't get anything out of worship today. Okay, well, I'll come back next week and try again. Okay, I mean, if that's where you're at, there's, there's God's grace is for you. But I want the band to come back up now. And just while they're coming up, I'm going to continue in Psalm 139 because I think this illustrates what I was talking about. Where, this is verse 7. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I'm having a great day, God, you're there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you're there. If I'm going through hell, God, you're there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the othermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall surely hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as day, for darkness is as light with you. Paul wrote to Timothy, and he said, if we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. And just to finish up in Psalms, for you, are, you form my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, O oh Lord. My soul knows it very well. And if you're watching on video, as soon as this is over, pull up a worship song and just scream it out at the top of your lungs and declare to whoever's around that God is greater than your circumstance. If you're here now, we're going to sing the last song we did again. And just for five minutes, pretend, don't pretend, just acknowledge the stuff, but say, God, you're greater. God, you're greater. I don't normally sing, but this time I'm going to shout. I don't normally stand, but this time I'm going to raise my hands. And here in this corporate place, God is greater than the biggest sin in our life that we don't talk about. And if we know that he's greater here, then he can remind us in that still small voice when we're by ourselves that he is greater there too. What happens here can change the world or it can be just another Sunday. God is here to change us and to transform us and to renew us and to make us more like him. The question is, do we trust him with our stuff? Do we know that we can trust him with our stuff? Give him a try, give him your stuff and see if he can't bear the load so much better than we can.